Hi guys, let's do a uh, quick presentation on the skeleton. And first comment is this, if I don't talk about it, you don't need to know about it. Everything that's gonna be on your test that deals with bone is gonna be in this presentation and it's gonna come out of my mouth. All right, first things first, before we can do anything else, we really need to talk about some general terms like a foramen, for example. Uh, foramens are small openings or orifices, if you will. So if you look at a skull like this one here, you can kind of see, I hope, there's a small hole here in the jaw that's a mental foramen. That is a small opening, that's a foramen. Or alternatively, on the bottom of the skull, there's a big opening like this one here, and that's referred to as the foramen magnum, magnum being large, okay, foramen magnum, but a foramen all the same. There are fossas. Fossas are small indentations in bone, typically where other bones articulate. Uh, for example, if I kind of pull my jaw out of the way here, that is a mandibular fossa, an area where the mandible articulates. It's just a little indentation there in the skull where the mandible fits so that it can then articulate. There are going to be canals, also meatuses. A meatus is a canal, a canal is a meatus. And canals, for example, are as shown here. This is the external acoustic meatus or canal, external acoustic meatus. And if I pull the skull open, there's also an internal acoustic meatus. So a meatus, a canal, it's the same basic concept. Fissures are big open cracks in bone. For example, here in the eyes, these are optical fissures, these big open cracks, like I can see you through one there. These big open cracks, that is a orbital fissure. Uh, there will be sutures. Sutures are areas where two bones connect to one another, uh, fibrous, in a fibrous nature, I should say. So that is a suture connecting the two parietal bones on the skull. Uh, there will be sinuses. Sinuses are openings or cavities within the bone. Here we have our real human skull. And this opening, that, see that hole? See this big open hole here? These are sinuses. When you say you get sinus pressure, it's pressure in these openings right underneath the bony surface. They basically make the bone a little bit lighter and uh, can do some other tasks for us as well that deal with voice we'll talk about later. And then, of course, there are lines and crests and tuberosities and processes. All of these are weird little undulations and projections. You know, weird little projections, things that stick off of the bone in strange ways. All of that fits into that last little category. So, let's talk about the difference between the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is the skull down to the sacrum, that is all of this here shown in blue, whereas the appendicular skeleton would be the arms and legs and their associated girdles. Now, all the bones and structures that you see here, these are all fair game for your exam. Knowing that you have ribs is a given, but being able to tell me how many you have from the different types, now that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. You know, like being able to tell me that you have a radius and ulna, that's great, but being able to uh, Tell me about the parts and pieces that make them up. That's what's important from my perspective. Now, your skull has several basic compartments, if you will. There's an anterior cranial fossa, which houses your frontal lobe and your olfactory devices. Uh, you have a middle, middle cranial fossa that kind of houses your temporal lobes of your brain. And then a posterior cranial fossa that houses your cerebellum, which is sort of right back there. Uh, that's all fair game. Uh, but not as important as these parts. Now, the skull is the most complicated part of this lab, the whole test. The skull is really the thing that, that like defines it. And I'll probably put at least five or six questions off of the skull, which means that's about, you know, um, call it between 10 and 20% of the test, maybe. Well, probably not that much. It'll be a lot. It'll be probably at least eight to ten points of the test. How's that? All right. So let's talk about it. Now, it looks like a lot because you got this picture, you got this one that looks like a lot, and then you got this picture that looks like a lot, and you have that picture that looks like a lot, this picture that looks like a lot. There's, there's a bunch of stuff to talk about here. But what I need to point out to you first is that, let's see, here's the sphenoid bone, all right? bone label. 
Here's the sphenoid bone label. There's the sphenoid bone label. Here's the sphenoid bone label. There's the sphenoid bone label. All right. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that all of these different pictures, they're just showing you different views of the same structures. So it's not like everything's completely different from one side to the next. It's all looking at the basic parts and pieces of the skull. Now, this is all going to be on you. You know, knock yourself out. You've got to learn all this. But I will go through and talk about a few things just to kind of help you get oriented to uh, know what you are doing. All right. Orbital fissures, as we talked about previously. You can see these quite clearly here in the skull. That would be this opening here and that opening there. These are orbital fissures. Now, we call these orbital fissures because anything with the eyes is considered orbital, and these are big open cracks. So they are orbital fissures, orbital fissures. Uh, there is an optic canal in there as well, and the optic canal is quite different. It's going to be hard for you to see on this, I imagine. But the optic canal is a small opening where the optic nerve would come in. And if you look at this from the inside, it's right there. So I can actually put that pointer through, and you can kind of see where the optic nerve would come from. I can even go forward a little bit, and you can see here where the optic canal goes in. This would be... Uh, there's a structure called the optic chiasma that the optic nerves come from, and it looks kind of like this, okay? It's a big lump, and it's got these two optic nerves that come out and go to the eyes, okay? And it would lay right on top of that, and the two optic nerves jam into the optic canals on either side of this structure. So those are optic canals, optic canals. You have the nasal concha, okay? The nasal concha, and these are, one, two, three of these, uh, little structures inside called the turbinates oftentimes. And that, they're parts of the ethmoid bone. I can actually go forward a little bit and you can see a nice turbinate there. This is a bony structure inside the nose and they're pretty cool. Uh, they help to spin the air as it's moving through the nasal cavity and warm it up and pull some of the debris out of it, clean it basically uh, on its way down. So you can see these in through the nose and I just find them to be pretty fascinating. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say here? You can see your occipital condyles down there connecting to the skull. You can't really tell what they are from this view because you're looking at it like this, okay? The occipital condyles there, they're actually here and there on the bottom of the skull. So it's probably better to go here and see the occipital condyles. So if you see something that makes no sense, like if you see here, you've got the uh, nasal bones, the maxilla, the lacrimal bones, and the ethmoid bone behind it. It's kind of hard to tell what the heck you're looking at, but if you look at it from the side, it's very obvious. All right, so you got to be careful which view you use for study. Nasal bone, uh, maxilla, lacrimal bone, ethmoid bone, and that'll help. Okay, so being able to realize that you need to change views is important. All right, what else do we want to talk about here? So obviously, the major bones of the skull are important, like the cranial bones themselves. I could get the skull cap back on this thing. So you've got your coronal suture, like the corona around the sun. Uh, you've got your parietal bones and your frontal bone, your occipital bone in the back. Yeah, man, totally fair game. Zygomatic bone, zygomatic process. This is always a fun, uh, fun question set to get at. So what we have here is the zygomatic bone, which forms a part of your cheekbone. I'm touching it right there. There's my zygomatic bone. And then my zygomatic bone becomes part of the zygomatic process. The zygomatic process, including two bones, the temporal and zygomatic. The temporal bone and the zygomatic bone both contribute to the zygomatic process. And that can be some tricky questioning. So what I'll do is I'll put a star on this thing. I'll put a star here, or I'll put a star out there. So I put a star here, and I say, what's the name of this bone? You'll say zygomatic bone. If I say, what's the name of this structure, you'll say it's a zygomatic process. If I put it there, I'll say, what's the name of this structure, you'll say zygomatic process. And I'll say, what bone is it a part of, you'll say temporal bone. Little bits and pieces, folks. Uh, also on this, you can see a styloid process and a mastoid process. It's kind of hard to figure out what you're dealing with here. Uh, what I will show you is that you can feel your mastoid process right behind your ear. 
It's what connects to your sternocleidomastoideus uh, muscle. Helps you kind of pull your head down in a way you can pinch that thing up. That's it, your mastoid process. And then, if that's your mastoid process, deep to that, all right, remember your scientific terms, deep to that is where you find the styloid process. They're not side by side. One is inset to the skull. There's the styloid process. Here's the mastoid process, all right? Styloid, mastoid. The styloid is deep. The mastoid is superficial. And external acoustic meatus. Now, I'm going to do both of these in unison here, the external acoustic meatus and the internal acoustic meatus. So your external acoustic meatus is here. This is where sound waves come in. Uh, so this would be the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear are kind of underneath where I've got my pointer here. So let's go to the inside. All of this is that right there. What I'm holding on to between my two fingers right there and right there, that is the middle and inner ear structures. So external acoustic meatus has sound waves coming in, and then they are processed and dealt with by nervous tissue, and then a nerve exits from the internal acoustic meatus, as shown here, the internal acoustic meatus, a nerve comes out here and goes into the brain, into uh, the temporal lobe, I believe, to help you interpret uh, these sounds and, and help you understand what they mean. So sound waves come in from the outside and a nerve exits from the inside because all of your inner ear and middle ear apparati are in there. This is kind of cool stuff, you know. All right, uh, I really like talking about the ethmoid bone and the cribriform plate, the crystagalli, and what are called the cribriform, or what I will call the olfactory foramina. Okay, you've got an ethmoid bone, shown here, an ethmoid bone, and on that ethmoid bone, you will find the cribriform plates, which are on either side, two cribriform plates, and then kind of Sticking up in the middle is a structure called the crista galli. And you can kind of see that right there. It sticks up. Okay, it really does stick up in a very obvious way. I don't know if you can really make this out, but it's right there. That's the crista galli. All right, the crista galli sticks up, and then on either side of it, you have the two cribriform plates. Now, the cribriform plates are very fascinating because they have holes in them called the cribriform foramina, or what I will call and what you will call the olfactory foramina. And the way this works is super cool. Your brain has these olfactory bulbs. They're just big fleshy things, and they lay down on top of, they just lay on top of the cribriform plates. And then they have little bipolar neurons that leave from these olfactory bulbs. They go down through the olfactory foramina, and they dangle into your nasal cavity at the superior nasal conchae. So they lay in right there. They sit right there. So that when you sniff, air is pushed in through the nose, it goes up and it's spun by the turbinates, and it hits the underside of the cribriform plates uh, where there are neurons. Those neurons pick up the chemicals that are in the air, carry that nervous signal through the olfactory foramina, which are parts of the cribriform plates, and back up into the brain to those olfactory bulbs. So that's a long roundabout way to get at that these little holes here in the cribriform plates um, basically are the, where nervous tissue passes through to carry smell signals from your inner nose area up into your brain. And that's, that's pretty cool, man. That's pretty neat from my perspective. Ah, uh, what else? So form of magnum I've already talked about. This is where your spinal cord connects. We've already talked about the uh, nasal conchae. I think that takes us here. So that's the skull. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> now, let me make sure that we are together on this. All this is fair game. Okay, all these parts and pieces are fair game. Um, I'm not going to talk about all. Actually, I need to talk about these. Yeah, let me talk about these. I forgot the um, major artery and vein. OK. The major artery and vein set that goes into your brain, into your skull, are the jugular vein and the carotid artery. Okay, the jugular vein and the carotid artery. The jugular vein, veins are really big. 
Uh, they come in via these really big openings like this one here and that one there. These are in the skull. And the way I do this is kind of hold it out like this. And it looks almost like a heart to me. Okay, the area where the jugular vein goes in through the skull and out from the bottom. If you look at it from the inside, it looks somewhat heart shaped. You see the high point, high point, and then the dip, sharp edge in the middle. It looks like a good old fashioned, you know, heart. Uh, those are jugular openings, okay, jugular foramens. The carotid canals, on the other hand, are right in front of that and they don't penetrate all the way through the skull. So you got to look at it from the bottom. If you find where the jugular foramen is, and you flip that over and you can see it here, where I've got my pointer, the carotid canals are right above it. And they look like a big hole with a smaller hole in them. Okay, that is a carotid canal. It is a big hole with a smaller hole inside of that. And that's really all I want to say about it. Go here. Okay, we need to talk about the vertebrae. Now, <clears throat> you have a number of, actually, you know what, let's start here. This is the um, hyoid bone. So your hyoid bone is here in the neck. It looks, I don't even have a label, look at that. <laughs> That's the hyoid bone, it looks something like this. So that is right underneath your chin sticking out like so. Uh, if you feel your Adam's apple, just a little above that, there's a little lump, and that's your hyoid bone. Uh, this is going to be a bone, it's kind of neat, it's free floating in the uh, system. It's not articulating with any other bones in the skeleton, it connects to nothing else. All it does is form a um, structure which supports the top of the trachea, so that when you breathe you can't collapse that upper tracheal passage and it forms a moving base for the tongue, which is kind of neat. So that is a hyoid bone, pretty neat. Now, you need to know all about the vertebrae. You need to realize that you have seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five fused sacral vertebrae, and four fused coxal vertebrae. I've heard three and I've heard four. It can kind of vary, I think. But seven, 12, five, and then five and four. Uh, the Hang on, do I have a better slide? All right, this is a quick breakdown of the vertebrae and the major parts and pieces that you need to be aware of. Like all vertebrae have spinous processes and transverse processes. All vertebrae have a vertebral foramen that the, um, what you call it, nerve cord goes through, and they will almost all have a nerve, or I'm sorry, a, a vertebral body that will have an intervening pad of fiber cartilage for articulating purposes. Okay, let's see. First of the vertebrae. What I've got here are two vertebrae called the axis and the atlas. The axis, axis and the atlas. And you need to become best friends with these. I guarantee you this is gonna be on your test. The top one, the upper one, is called the atlas, and it's basically a big circle, all right? The atlas is a big old circle. I've heard people say it looks like Master Yoda, okay? Ears on the sides, all right? That is an atlas. The atlas connects to the base of the skull like that, all right? So those occipital condyles I talked about previously, they connect to the atlas of the vertebral column. And the next vertebrae is the axis. Now these two are different from all the rest because of their unique relationship. The atlas, wrong, wrong, wrong. The atlas is a big circle. The axis has a structure on top of it called the dens. You can see this quite clearly here. Looks good and flat. Called the dens. The reality is it sticks up like this. Okay, there's the dens. So you've got your axis, which has the dens, and you have the axis, which is a big, the atlas. You can see how this becomes a problem. Let me just lay this on you very simplistically. The atlas has a big open circle. The axis has the dens. And what these will do is they will articulate with each other like this. 
when you rotate your head side to side, most of that rotation is right there. The rest of your vertebrae don't really have a whole lot of a job to do. When you tilt your head forwards and backwards, most of that rotation is right here in the axis and the atlas. The axis and the atlas with their DENS connection, the way that they have it, uh, this provides most of the motility of your head. And the reason for this is very simple. In this, they have a unique type of joint called a pivot joint, a pivot joint. And that pivot joint is the same kind of joint that you have in your arm that allows you to twist your arm like so, that allows you to twist your head in the fashion that you can twist your head. So you need to be able to identify the axis and the dens versus the atlas, and then tell me that they have a pivot joint and that they involve most of the movement of the head when you move your head around. They are also the first two of your seven cervical vertebrae. Now, in general, cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, and lumbar vertebrae, they are very easy to, dis to distinguish from one another. Let's just take a look, shall we? the stove folks all right there's a good one this is a really nice cervical vertebrae you can tell it's a cervical vertebrae quite clearly because it has transverse foramen no other bones in the skeleton no other vertebrae have these transverse foramina like here and there okay so these are transverse foramen uh, if you see that you know you're dealing with a, set, a cervical vertebrae on your test, I'll say, how many cervical vertebrae do you, no, 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 I'll say, what kind of vertebrae is that? You'll say cervical. I'll say, how many do you have? You'll say seven. Now, you can look at that and say, okay, transverse foramen, cervical. There's an easier way to do this. If it looks like a big smiley face, okay, eye, eye, mouth, it's probably a cervical vertebrae, okay? Big smiley face, good sign. If it's a good sign, that's a cervical vertebrae. All right, next, let's see. Next we have the thoracic vertebrae. And thoracic vertebrae are very easily distinguished because thoracic vertebrae have what are called costal facets. What you have to keep in mind is that the thoracic vertebrae all connect to ribs, okay? All thoracic vertebrae have rib connection points and those rib connection points are called costal facets. So if you see costal facets, like this indentation here, and that indentation there, you know that this is a thoracic vertebrae. Or alternatively, if it looks like a giraffe, can you see it? Horn, ear, long mouth, or nose I should say. Horn, ear, long nose. If it looks like a giraffe, probably a thoracic vertebrae. Probably a thoracic vertebrae. And then, last but not least, big old honking lumbar vertebrae. Now, one, lumbar vertebrae tend to be much larger. Okay, they're way bigger. Like here is a, uh, an atlas, and there's a lumbar vertebrae. All right, it's just way different. And uh, not only does it look way different, but it's got no costal facets, so you know it's lumbar. But if it looks like a moose, nose, horns, ears. If it looks like a moose, probably a lumbar vertebrae. All right. So I'll say, what kind of vertebrae is that? You'll say lumbar. I'll say, how many of them are there? You'll say five. This is the kind of thing I'm looking for. And I'll say, uh, what is this structure called? And you'll say it's the body. Not that fancy. All right, this is the sacrum. On the sacrum, I will point out the existence of the sacral canal, which is an opening it goes all the way through the sacrum and houses parts of the nerve cord. Um, I will point out the coccyx. There's really not a whole lot that I want you to know about this. Mainly, I want you to be able to tell me that it is the sacrum and it's the point of attachment for the pelvic bones. Now, the ribs are very important to me. On these ribs, you need to be able to tell me that you have seven true ribs, three false ribs, and then two floating ribs. There are 12 total. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay? True ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. And the reason that we call these true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs is because the true ribs connect straight to the sternum. A true rib will connect 
straight to the sternum. The false ribs connect to each other first and then to the sternum. And the floating ribs, they have no connection to the sternum whatsoever. True, false, and floating ribs. And, um, yeah, man, I wish we could be in person for this. I would love for you to be able to see how the ribs articulate with the vertebrae. It's just really neat how these fit together, the way they're structured. It's just amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, <sighs> here we are, right? Okay, so let's just keep on rolling. So this is a clavicle, also referred to as your collarbone. Clavicle is kind of weird. Some parts of it formed by intramembranous ossification, other parts of it formed by endochondral ossification. It's just a really weird bone. And this, again, does form your collarbones, as you can see here. Now, these are very important, are your clavicles, because they are the only connection to your skeleton for your entire arm setup. Okay, your scapulae, your humerus, all of this fun stuff, all of it is floating out there. The only real point of connection is here at the collarbones, the clavicles. That in mind, let's talk about the scapula. All right, on the scapula, what we have here is the spine of the scapula. It comes out to the acromion process, which is this one here. Follow the spine out to the acromion process. From here, you can drop down and look at the coracoid process, as shown here. So spine out to acromion, then drop down to the coracoid, and then you have a glenoid cavity, which is here. The glenoid cavity is the point of articulation for the humerus. So the humerus would connect in at the glenoid cavity, just like that. Uh, what else do I want to say here? Supraspinous and infra, infraspinous fossas. Supraspinous fossa here, infraspinous fossa here. And then if you flip this thing over, you have a subscapular fossa. And that is the scapula. Now the reason I want you to know all these parts, for example, like the supraspinous fossa, uh, is because when we do muscles, there are going to be like muscles named after these. So it's a supraspinous fossa, and then when we do muscles, it's going to have a bone, or I'm sorry, a muscle in it called a supraspinatus, for example. So all of these parts and pieces, these are all fair game. Now the reason that you have this huge scapula that would fit on me something like this is because muscle just wraps all around this thing. Man. This wraps all around it. So I can hold my arm out like this and my arm doesn't just drip down and fall because of all the muscle on my scapula locking in the arm and keeping it from moving. Remember, the only point of connection for my arm is right here at my sternum. Okay, So all that is held up by the muscles of my scapula. Now, I think I neglected the uh, sternum. So let's do that real quick. The sternum is here. The parts I want you to know is that the sternum has the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. Manubrium, body, and xiphoid process. This is a humerus. The humerus has a head at the top. That's referred to as the anatomical neck is not unlike that seen in a femur, okay? A femur and a humerus are very similar bones. They have a head and a neck, a head and a neck. Uh, on the femur, there's a greater and lesser trochanter. On the humerus, there's a greater and lesser tubercle. So they're, they're very similar bones. Uh, but on this humerus, you've got the head here, you've got the anatomical neck, which will be around there, and then a surgical neck, which is what they call this portion here, where when it breaks, it, it requires a lot of work to put things back together. Uh, this in particular is a right humerus, and you can see that quite easily because this big concavity in the back is called the olecranon fossa. There it is, the olecranon fossa. Now we call this the olecranon fossa for a very particular reason, and that is, if I can find an ulna, that the ulna has an olecranon process. And what happens is when the arm fits together like so, you extend the arm, the olecranon process has to have somewhere to go. And that is into this big opening on the back of the arm called the olecranon fossa. Olecranon process, olecranon fossa. If the olecranon fossa is there, that has to mean that that is the back of the arm. And if the head is here, and this is the back, this must be a right arm. Okay, let me see if there's a left. Right, here is a left arm by comparison. 
head here, or liquid on fossa there, head here, or liquid on fossa here. So this would be a right arm and a left arm. Now, uh, is there anything else I want to talk about here? So we did head, anatomical neck, surgical neck. I will point out the deltoid tuberosity. That's this point here. Uh, the deltoid muscle is here and it comes down and connects to the humerus to lift your arm up. That is um, Wolf's Law would state that bones respond to the stresses placed upon them. So if you're constantly pulling against the arm right here, it makes it just a little thicker. Okay, just a little thicker, a little thicker. Uh, so that is the deltoid tuberosity. Now, at the base of the humerus, you have to know your olecranon fossa, your medial and lateral epicondyles, and your trochlea and capitulum. Now, this is very simple. Med oh, no, no, no. Here's the head, so this is medial. Medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, and then the trochlea and capitulum. Now, bear with me here, but from my perspective, trochlea sounds like a very sharp word. It's the trochlea, and then the capitulum with a C seems very round for me. I don't know why, but in my brain, I think of trochlea as being sharp and pointy, and capitulum as being very round. So the capitulum is quite round, and the trochlea is quite pointy. These are articulation points for the radius and the ulna, which are hopefully next. There they are. All right, here's a radius and ulna. And they would fit together something like that. Now, what I want you to notice is on the ulna, we've got this coronoid process, not a coracoid process, but a coronoid process and this olecranon uh, <clears throat> process. So olecranon process and the coronoid process. On this, beside it, you can see an indentation. It's a smooth spot. And we've got our radius here. It's going to fit against it like that. The round end of the radius okay, sits into this round spot. And there would be a thick band of connective tissue that wraps around that and holds it like so. And that forms a pivot joint that allows these two bones to twist upon one another so that your hand can twist in that fashion. So there's that pivot joint yet again. Now at the other side of this, you'll see there's kind of a round end at the bottom of the ulna, and then an indentation at the bottom of the radius. And these two fit together like this, again, so that they can twist upon one another, uh, giving you that ability to rotate your arm. Now I want to point out one thing before we move forward, and that is the shape here. You have a styloid po uh, process of the radius and a styloid process of the ulna. And the reason that these exist is so that the hand can sit in that, and it's hard for the hand to shimmy off of its base. In fact, if you look at a femur and tibia, we have here. No, what am I talking about? A tibia and a fibula. We have here. What you need to notice is that the base of the tibia and the fibula are very similar to the base of the radius on the ulna. You have these what are called malleoli here and what are called styloids here. Okay? They're very similar. This way so the foot can't shimmy off of its base, and this way so the hand can't shimmy off of its base. You need to realize that these are all similar bones, quite similar bones. All right. So electronal process, coronoid process, sure. Uh, being able to tell me which one's the radius and which one's the ulna, it's very easy. The ulna has a U for ulna, and you see the dip there where it articulates with the humerus, okay? Um, so the ulna has a U on it, and the radius has a circle. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. It's good enough for me. Let's go here. So this is the hand, uh, your lab manual that you don't necessarily need doesn't list all of the bones of the hand, so I'm not going to make you know them in the summer either. What I want you to know is this, you have, uh, let's do it from the bottom, carpals, these are short bones, the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. If you have a ring, that ring would be kind of like right there, okay? This is the hand, like this part of the hand, 
And then the phalanges, these last three, these are the fingers. So that's how it would be. And again, the carpals, these flat bones allow for some of the rotation that takes place. So we've got our phalanges, our carpals, I don't know, our phalanges, our metacarpals, and our carpals. I'm pretty happy. Pretty happy with that. Let's go here. Uh, this is a pelvis. And on the pelvis, I expect you to know the basic parts here, okay? So let me go grab a pelvis. And we'll talk about it. Uh, so on this, you have two what are called coxal bones and the sacrum. The sacrum is here in the middle. And then this is a coxa, and this is a coxa. You might also hear these called um, uh, innominate bones or the os innominati. I call them coxal bones or just hip bones, if you want to be real simple. And on these, you need to know that they are made up of three fused bones each. They have ilium, the ilia, okay, that's the top part. The ischia, which are on the back, kind of here, okay. And then up front, the pubic bones. Pubic bones, ischial bones, and ileal bones. These, like on your, your hips, you can feel your hip there, that's the iliac crest of the pelvis. So ilia, ischia, and pubic. Uh, what else do we want to talk about here? So you get the acetabuli. Um, and acetabulum is this opening here where the femur connects. Okay, it's this concavity. That's an acetabulum. The femur would dip into that and have a very strong connection. That's an acetabulum. In the coccyx and the sacrum. I might ask you how many fused bones are in the sacrum. Uh, these are broken down uh, coxal bones. And I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail on this. What I will point out is the obturator foramen. Okay, these are obturator foramens. One there, one there. Uh, I will point out the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch is the ischial spine. So that's an ischial spine. This is a greater sciatic notch. That's a letter, lesser sciatic notch. And the reason I point these out is because this plays into how you can identify differences between a male and female pelvis. They are, in fact, quite different, and this plays a role in that. Might even be the next slide. Let's see. Ah. Differences between male and female pelvis. Now, I don't think I have a female pelvis sitting around anywhere. That's a real shame. So let's just talk about the male pelvis because I have it in my hands here. Okay, this is very easily a male pelvis. It's very simple and very straightforward when you look at it. Uh, there are a number of ways of doing this. The, the most simple way to identify a pelvis as male and female is by doing what I would call a U and V test. Okay, you look at it upside down. If it looks like a V, sharp edges, male. Okay, if it's very U-shaped and very smooth, female. Because the male pelvis is really compact, uh, and as a result of that, you get these sharp angles. Whereas the female pelvis is, is expanded, it's wider. So you get more of a gradual U-shape, if that makes any sense at all. Now further, if you take this thing and just look through it, and if it looks like a baby would fit through there, female pelvis. But this, like look how the sacrum is curved in. They call this a sacral angle. Like the sacrum is really like tipped in. The, um, what do you call it, coccyx bone is tilted inwards. The ischial spines are really like inward in shape. They're pushed in. So this is very much cluttered, like the passage through the pelvis is very much cluttered. There's zero chance of a child passing through this. This is clearly a male pelvis. A female pelvis would be, instead of like this, it would be like this. The sacral angle is really kicked out. The coccyx is pointing more downwards. The ischial spines, instead of being poking in like this, they're tilted out like that. Uh, they're just very different, it's just a very different situation. Yeah, you can see that. So here's a male pelvis tilted in, here's a female pelvis tilted out. Uh, you can see the ischial spine kicked out that way. Yeah, look at this. So here are the ischial spines. They're very different in a female versus male. The male pelvis is much more compact, whereas the female pelvis is much more open. 
And that takes us down to the femur. So here's a good femur, biggest bone in the body, man. Very cool. On the femur, there's a lot of parts and pieces that I need you to be familiar with. It's all here, man, it's all here. So let's just start at the top and work our way down. This is the head of the femur, and it's got inside of this a fovea capitis. This is very important. The fovea ca uh, capitis is where a big old ligament connects that holds, you see another indentation here, that ligament holds the femur into the pelvis. Makes for a very, very strong connection. Uh, tearing that ligament is hard to do and catastrophic. All right, so there is the head with the fovea capitis. There's the neck. Greater and lesser trochanthers. Do I have linea aspera on here? I do. I do have a linea aspera that goes down through here. And um, I'm not even going to be concerned with the intertrochanthric line at this stage, but I will talk about the parts and pieces down here. This would be a right femur. There's the head. You can see the patellar surface that makes this the front. So that's a right leg. Uh, so what do I want to say here? That would be a lateral epicondyle. This would be a medial epicondyle. Makes this a lateral condyle and this a medial condyle. Again, patellar surface. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, and the patella is also fair game. I wish I had one here to show you. But I don't. At least nothing handy. Uh, what I will say, however, is the patella is a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid. Uh, sesamoid bones are found within ligaments or tendons, and they will allow for the articulation on a surface so that the tendon itself doesn't rub on that surface. If the tendon rubbed against the knee in this spot, uh, you would end up with osteoarthritis. Okay, it would tear away the cartilage and damage it. But by having the bone there, it prevents it from taking place. So it's a protective measure. Are these sesamoid bones like the patella? All right, and that will make this tibia and fibula. Now, this is a tibia. This is a fibula. The fibula is very thin and spindly. The tibia is like a darn club, man. This thing's real thick up top and very strong. The real tibia, it's hefty, man. They're pretty tough. And that makes perfect sense because you got to think about like all the weight of the body is heading down and the lower leg bones have to get bigger and heavier to deal with the weight of the upper parts. And what really happens here, now the femur is real big by itself, but what we do with the tibia and the fibula is that we connect these two together like so. And in between here is going to be a real thick osseous membrane. Do I have it labeled? I don't. Uh, it's referred to as an interosseous membrane. And think about it as like a, if you know what an ace bandage is, think about it like an ace bandage. Dude, these bones are so warped, man. Uh, but regardless, it's like wrapping around these two bones, basically fusing them together into one structural unit that is, in fact, as stronger, stronger than that femur is. Real tough is the tibia and the fibula once it's all, you know, assembled together. And at the base of this, you have what are called the malleoli. Again, the foot would fit in something like this, not unlike how the hand fits together. This kind of prevents it from shimmying side to side. So you get your fibula and your tibia. And the tibia has some other parts that I want you to be aware of. Uh, first is this intercondylar eminence. That's this top part here, the intercondylar eminence. What's important about the intercondylar eminence is uh, that this is where your ACL connects. Okay, the anterior cruciate ligament that people oftentimes hear about tearing. Yeah, man, right there. That's where it connects. Ah, what else do I want to say here? So we've got our medial and lateral uh, condyle. No, no, no. Let's not, let's not do that. Hey, I'm pretty happy. I am pretty happy with what we've got so far. So let's just keep rolling, let's just keep rolling. All, all of that's fair game, you know, it's a, one of my favorites. And here. Um, here we have a knee. On this knee, what I want to point out here is you've got, well hang on, here's a femur coming down to the tibia and the fibula here and there. 
and this is how they connect to one another. You can see intervening pads of meniscus inside of here, and this would also be covered with hyaline cartilage. Now, this in particular is a right leg, and on this, that would make this a lateral collateral ligament, or an LCL, and this a medial collateral ligament, or an MCL. Again, right leg, medial. Uh, then you've got in the front, you've got a quadriceps tendon that comes down to the patella, which is there, and that makes this the patellar ligament. Patellar ligament, quadriceps tendon. And the idea is when the knee is bent and you flex your quads, it straightens the leg out. All right, that's how this works. It's how you extend your leg. Now, if I turn this around backwards, what you're looking at first is what's called the posterior cruciate ligament, or PCL. The ACL, which again is quite famous, begins here at the back, and it sort of comes in and connects at that intercondylar eminence. You can see it inside of there. The reason they call them the cruciate ligaments is if you look at them, they form a cross shape like this. All right, they are crossed. They are cruciate ligaments. That works. And then I think it's last but not least is the foot, man. Now on the foot, there's a few of these bones I want you to be aware of, but first things first, these are the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. As opposed to carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, it's tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. And I'm gonna point out a few of these that you need to know. Now let's just keep it real simple. The calcaneus, okay, that's the big one back here, calcaneus and the talus. The talus articulates with the tibia, okay, just like that, and the calcaneus is your heel bone. Uh, I expect you to know those two, and that'll pretty much do it. So that's most all the parts and pieces of the skeleton that I need you to be familiar with for this lab, and uh, be expecting a quiz on this pretty soon. Thanks, guys.